Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So pop the kettle on, this is The Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. The King has been conducting the first state visit of his reign. Meanwhile, across the pond, gone, but certainly not forgotten. And it's emerged Harry and Meghan have been honoured with a Human Rights Award for their heroic stand against structural racism. Joining me today, our royal commentator and Talk TV regular, Afia Hagen, the royal editor at the Evening Standard, Robert Jobson, and royal commentator and Talk TV host, Daisy McAndrew. Hello, welcome uh, to all of you. Now, this week, King Charles welcomed the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, to the UK for the first state visit of his reign with Queen Consort Camilla and the Prince and Princess of Wales by his side. Now, Robert, as we've discussed on this show before, there's a lot of thinking that goes into the firsts of a reign. This the first incoming state visit. What was behind it? Well, it's all about soft power. It's all about diplomacy and, uh, and it did... I uh, think they did it particularly well. Kate looked amazing. Well, they all looked great. And I think that uh, it was the first one in incoming state visit since Trump 2019. So, I, you know, we do these things pretty well. But I think a lot of people got their heart under the collar about how much money was being spent. I mean, these things are budgeted for by the Foreign Office. Um, and you've also got to remember that when, say, Cyril Ramaphosa is hosting a state visit incoming, it'll be a very similar thing in reverse. And I've been to a number of those where, you know, it's just as, just as um, much money is spent on it as if it was a, in, a, in a palace. What a contrast for Cyril Ramaphosa, leaving behind blackouts back at home in South Africa and arriving here to this glittering white tie banquet with all the tiaras and the finest jewels yeah. on display. Um, and so many bits to, to pick up on. Lots of significance in the jewels that were chosen to be worn both by Camilla um, and by uh, Kate, Princess of Wales. Of course, earlier on in the day, it was the Prince and Princess of Wales that had to do the escorting uh, of the president from his hotel to the, the first um, changing of the guards or inspecting the guards. And she was wearing the three feathers pendant that symbolises a Princess of Wales. So that was a significant moment. And then, of course, the choice of the, um, the not tiara, the lovers not tiara and I mean it is funny these things you wouldn't think it but there are people literally putting bets on which tiara will be worn and is it going to be you know her favorite this is one that one that she'd actually worn many times before but again it was a nod to Princess Diana who who famously wore it on that Hong Kong visit where she was wearing the pearl embellished mm. uh, ball gown uh, and Princess Diana used to say that she loved wearing it but hated wearing it because it was so heavy it would give her a headache and then Kate was wearing the princess uh, diamond and pearl earrings and a bracelet that had been the Queen. So lots of things for the uh, royal jewel watchers to uh, to get excited about. And actually, this was kind of an almost an accidental first state visit for um, Cyril Ramaphosa from South Africa because it had been pushed back uh, due to COVID. His wife didn't accompany him because she was having uh, some medical treatment. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, definitely the power of soft diplomacy, as you said, you know, this is what the royal family is for and this is what they do best, this kind of soft diplomacy. And it's very important. You know, you had Cyril Ramaphosa addressing at both houses of parliament yesterday. He had a meeting with Rishi Sunak. So like you said, Daisy, I like that um, politics with a small p, but still very important and still very significant. And like you said, climate change being on the agenda. But Cyril Ramaphosa has a huge job to do back in South Africa. He left um, when he he attended the Queen's funeral. He actually left early because of the rolling blackouts that they've had in the country. You know, people going without electricity to address those problems. And Parliamentary he, panel looking at whether they're going to impeach him. Yep, absolutely. You know, and pressure on him from both sides uh, for his position with the war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia as well. So he does have some big challenges at home. And this is going to definitely be a bit of a boost for him. I think it was interesting on this trip also, not just uh, that it was the king's big day in the spotlight, but in, in fact, it was yet another example of the smaller but tighter uh, working royals being being wheeled out to do various duties. And, and interestingly, we saw Prince Edward yes. have quite a significant role day in, two in, in, was in this very visit. Much Prince Edward's well, day. also, yeah. funny enough, I was at the palace the other day doing a, an engagement for small businesses. Um, that there was a reception there. And again, 
Duke Kent and the Duke of Gloucester mm. yeah. were both were both there, and they, you know I was saying, why me? They seem to be doing an awful lot mm -hmm. for their age, but they are. I think more they, you know, they very much want to support um, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the king, the second cousin, in the in the wake of the queen's death, and they've been at most of those sort of receptions. And Prince Edward is going to be at the variety performance mm -hmm. as well. His first time attending, he's going to attend that on behalf of the king. So yeah, definitely, it seems like they are being wheeled out more. Yeah. <laughs> And we had another very important engagement for the Queen Consort this week, escorting another VIP, Paddington Bear this mm. time, uh, to his new home. Many Paddingtons, in fact, left outside palaces and in royal parks in memory of the late Queen, uh, being donated to Bernardo's children's homes. I mean, I love the pictures that, that were released of Paddington having fun in the palace. You're a bit <laughs> a little cynical. bit of eye rolling going <laughs> yeah, on, am I right? I'm <laughs> cynical no, about no, this. No, no, I, like like this. I, loved, I loved the whole, you know, the Paddington sketch was great, and I think it was wonderful that Paddington spoke. For the nation, when when he, when he said, "Do you, you think know, that bear's being queen. flogged a bit too but much?" I, th I think you know. I'm sure that the Paddington people have got the uh, the money for making Paddingtons are very happy yeah. about it. All. I, I think what was really clever <laughs> about this, actually, on, on behalf of the palace, is last week when they tweeted all the adventures that Paddington had been on, mm. and he was like sliding <laughs> down the banisters and like doing all these cheeky things at Buckingham Palace. But that was really cute. Like the PR team certainly got that right, and now a little you know, bit of levity. Absolutely. goes a long way yeah. sometimes, doesn't it? And actually a bit of, you know, the royal family will be able to poke a bit of fun at themselves. Mm. And now that you have, you know, they're all going out to uh, different children's charities through Bernardo's, so different children will get all these Paddingtons. Um, and then Paddington will start popping up on eBay. <laughs> Who could begrudge them that, Robert, the Grinch, Humbug. sitting here in the middle of our <laughs> panel? Exactly. Um, more details emerged this week about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's Human Rights Award. They are going to be on for their heroic stand against structural racism in the monarchy. The New York Gala is organised by the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Foundation and Kerry Kennedy, the politician's daughter, a lawyer and human rights activist, has said they went to the oldest institution in UK history and told them what they were doing was wrong, that they couldn't have structural racism within the institution, that they could not maintain a misunderstanding about mental health. They knew that if they did this, there would be consequences, that they would be ostracised, they would lose their their family, their position within this structure, and that people would blame them for it. Um, Daisy, let's start with you on this one. I, I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty powerful mm. statement from Kerry Kennedy. What do you make of it? Well, there are two audiences here that will have very, very different reactions to this statement. I think this will go down very well in liberal America, which is arguably the most important demographic for Harry and Meghan. I think that is where they want to make their bed and make their money. Um, and that is where, you know, where they've, they've staked their claim. And I think it will go down pretty badly for those that really look at it in, in detail on this side of the pond, because it's in, it, it's, it's insulting in many ways uh, to the royal family and a royal family that many Brits still feel protective of and don't recognise this as the royal family that they think of. And uh, and that leads you to the, the, the next decision, well, why are Harry and Meghan allowing this? This is Meghan with Harry behind her really stepping into a political sphere. When someone experiences racism, it's very important for them to be able to say, this is what happened to me and for them to call it out. And I do agree with what Kerry Kennedy said when she said, you know, they knew that if they did that, there would be con consequences, they would be ostracized, they would lose the position within that family, which is pretty much what happened. Um, I don't agree that I think it's, um, you know, Meghan with Harry, you know, standing behind her. I think it's Meghan and Harry standing side by side and standing up for things they believe in and calling out for things that they see, things that have happened to them and saying that we won't be a part of it. We're going to call it out in the hopes that we can be part of a solution. Uh, and that is what human rights is all about. So good for them. Good for them, Robert. Um, great fan of Robert F. Kennedy, Attorney General, and John F. Kennedy. What they did for human rights, you know, for civil rights in America, was really worthy of awards. I'm not sure that this is heroic. I'm not sure that they're worthy of awards. I certainly don't really think they've done enough yet um, in terms of their foundation. Um, that said, um, there are many people that would uh, say that what they did was heroic. I think it'd have been heroic if they'd named names and not led this 
media circus that came around afterwards. If you're going to call it out, call it out. Amid this backdrop of the Oprah interview and we've got the Netflix documentary coming out later on uh, next book. month on the 8th of December and the book coming yeah. out on the 10th of January. What do the Waleses need to do? It's, to win over that US audience? It's a big challenge because a lot of those questions will be in the background and they will get a lot of attention. Kate obviously will get all the, you know, the, the, the photographs taken of her, so a lot will be read into her body language and so on, but she is not somebody who's going to talk openly, neither of them are, about, about, about these issues. So a lot will be spoken about them without them getting the opportunity to address these issues head on. So I think it is a very difficult challenge. And uh, we've talked so many times about the crown on this show, and it is worth remembering that the American view of the royal family is very, very coloured by TV shows like that and by interviews with Oprah Winfrey and by you know what they consume. And everything will be seen through that filter. So it, it, it will be a really important trip. If I was them... You know, it was controversial, but I would go on to one of the main networks if I was William and repeat exactly what he says. We're not a racist family. If there's anything that you've got that proves we are, say it. Otherwise, let's call this a draw a line under it. Because, you, you know, you can't keep saying the institution is, is, is racist without any evidence and without it being checked. It's now just because it's been put into the, their narrative, their truth, it's becoming the truth. Um, and I just don't, I don't recognise And that American audience, sorry if it is, it is obsessed with the relationship between Harry and William. Mm. It is all they want but to talk about. And so that that is going to be you know, absolutely central to this visit. And there is no sign of a rapprochement. But I think also as well, because this isn't just like your bog standard royal visit, they are going for the Earthshot Prize, which is, you know, it's, mm. it's climate change, it's environmental. Big, That's yeah. a hot topic as well. And I hope also that they've learned from their Caribbean I trip. I was just going to say. Yeah. Earlier on in the year, which which was essentially a PR disaster. Hopefully, the PR team are going to get it right this time. It was hijacked with a bit. It was, I mean, I was on that trip. It was very um, much hijacked. You've only got to look at what actually... Photographic, photographs were taken in situations that were completely not as it was portrayed um, out, uh, from where but, it was. But, 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 but it can still be a PR disaster, then, whether then, or then not. Then they've got to get hold of it at yeah. the very beginning. Yeah. Mm. And if you're going to be accused of things like that, which was completely nonsense. I mean, Ryan Sterling went up to the, the, the fence which was a fence that was already there for a football match in, in the middle of Trenchtown because it was already there. They can't but, tear but, it down. But the, but the thing you is, can't tear but, it down. But, That's where they play football. But the PR team should realise how these things will come across because at, there's absolutely two sides to every well, story. You can't there's, tear it down. You can't tear a football pitch down. I but mean, there's what you know. we saw... And how it was portrayed. You and saw that, a photograph. And that you is, saw a photograph. But, but the PR team should have had the insight to know and to see but how I was there. It was, it was about, I'll tell you how many kids there were. There were probably thousands of children all but, around but, that what, outside, you know, to saying, see that well, that was one shot that was taken. What I'm saying, I'm blown like, right if, out if, of it. What I'm saying, if you let me finish, is that the PR team should have the insight and should have the foresight to see how these it, things are going to come across. Because you were there and you know what it was, but what it came well, across as is too. I must admit, things. I didn't at the time because you. You wouldn't because it was a mob mm -hmm. of people around them so it's easy to say that in terms of from a distance and from you know a particular photograph here i think they need to get the take the ball by the horns and address an issue that is coming back and back and back you can't mm -hmm. just ignore it and if you're going to america where there's this they're getting they're, his brother and sister-in-law getting awarded for and in black and white as sarah read out you know, outing an institution that is racist. You have to counter that. And one week after the Earthshot Prize takes place, we are expecting Harry and Meghan's documentary mm. to be released on Netflix. Mm. What about what comes with that? Because it's not just a documentary, is it? Mm. Do they have to do the PR, the sit-downs, the interviews, the promotion? Do you it's, expect it's to America, see them on a big I expect, PR I expect push? If the money that has been spent, I cannot imagine that they won't be a PR push. So I think we can expect them to see um, one or two probably headline interviews talking about the documentary and talking about what we can expect. Uh, and of course, I think then, they will. what are the other questions that that are asked? Well, I hope there is. I hope there is because obviously, otherwise, we're going to get we back down the same road again. What we got with opera, which was terrible journalism, basically with nobody countering. What is, the, what is being said. Let's move on, though, because 30 years after the infamous toe-sucking scandal, Fergie's former lover, John Bryan, has broken his silence and he has claimed it was a totally innocent game of 
Cinderella. I mean, the PR <laughs> blunders just talk about putting your foot in it in, in yeah. more ways than one. It just is reminding everybody of that Absolutely. toe curling episode. Well, it's come up because of the crown, hasn't yes. it? Uh, yeah. And its depiction again in the crown. But I it think was huge know. at the time. I mean, it was massive. Yes. I remember, I mean, you couldn't believe the pictures. I mean, they were in. It was James Whitaker and the, and the Daily Mirror got the pictures. They were massive, huge tight at the time. But the the, the reality is, I think... He Fergie did, was he, at Balmoral, wasn't she? When can you imagine going to breakfast, coming down for breakfast, and then they're all looking at the paper? <laughs> and more interestingly, perhaps, is the line that John Bryan was called in after Andrew's Newsnight interview, Daisy, well, to give advice on strategy, how they this, should handle this it. Is what I mean. Would you go to John Bryan for PR advice, the a man who is defined as a toe sucker and has never managed to move on from that? The one thing that Andrew wants to do is to try to move on. Yeah, but his advice wasn't bad, was it? it was, he showed no empathy to the victims of the, yeah. the, Epstein, the Epstein victims. And so he, he, was, he, he then issued a statement afterwards, didn't he, Andrew, saying saying that he did empathise and sympathise. But perhaps they should have brought him in before the interview and not afterwards, <laughs> I because think this, this being around after the fact... Hindsight is twenty twenty. It's a wonderful thing, yeah, isn't it? I mean, Definitely. I, I think if they had hindsight, there shouldn't have been a news night interview. At but, all, yeah. John Bryan maintains in this interview that he believes Andrew is innocent and actually that I think Andrew Epstein be, was yeah. trying to extort money from the Queen ultimately by blackmailing I, I th Andrew. I think you've got to remember that the settlement has taken place and people are saying that the settlement proves he's, he's guilty and it, and it doesn't. The reality is the Dershowitz um, settlement uh, says more about Virginia Gouffray, I think, than, than anything, which she pulled the whole story right at the last minute. He well, wasn't, I mean, that's what Andrew's he people wasn't hoping, able, isn't it, that he it wasn't discredits able. her, but he still settled, didn't no, he? No, but he, he wasn't able to take it any further, really, because when the Jubilee was coming up, um, uh, it was quite clear from the other members of the royal family that he had to pull the plug on it, and they did want him to pursue it. So he was left between the devil and the deep blue sea. He wanted to pursue it, thought he, therefore that's why he was allowed to be stripped of all, the, uh, all his royal... Um, trappings and he wanted to go all the way but then was told pretty much he couldn't and therefore he wasn't able to defend himself and now people say he's guilty. I mean I'm not defending it, I'm just saying that it was not proven and we should remember that. I think the one thing that the whole episode has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt is that Andrew is not intelligent and that he has had a lack of intelligence at almost everything he's done which has got him into situations and, and continues to be. And a lack that, that of awareness, true. not that, being able that to, is true, to read but, the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but that, that is absolutely true. But he would have been, you know, the other thing, when you, the problem I think he's faced is that he may not have been intelligent, but he wanted to fight this all the way. And if you want to fight something all the way in court, you've got to be pretty sure of your ground. Now, he might not be intelligent, but he certainly had the money to pay for a lot of intelligent people around him to advise but him. But wouldn't lawyers. it have been excruciating for that to have been well, That's why the, the plug was yeah. pulled. Okay. That is yeah. why the plug was pulled. It's all right for Alan Dershowitz, the lawyer that fought uh, uh, Virginia Gouffray, to, to do that. Because at the end of the day, no one really knows or cares who he is. But this would have been the royal family exposed in a way that they couldn't really be exposed and the Queen really wouldn't, I mean at that time the Queen not particularly well but we had the Jubilee coming up, it just wouldn't work. That is all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Daisy, Robert and Afia. We will be back next week with all the latest on the Royal Family. We hope you can join us and we'll see you again then.